Good morning, everyone. I hope you had an awesome weekend. Oh, I'm a little sore, I gotta tell you. I hiked five and a half miles this weekend to get in shape for the Grand Canyon. And then I ran a mor this morning a mile. I'm supposed to do two miles, but I decided to break it up. One mile in the morning, one mile in the evening. <laughs> But it feels good. It feels good to be getting back in shape. It feels good to have a goal that I'm trying to achieve. Um, it feels good to feel like I'm finally coming into myself and like a phoenix rising from the ashes. <laughs> I kind of feel like um, that's, things are changing. They're getting better. And so, yeah, this weekend was really great with being able to do that hike and just start to feel like I'm in control again. And knowing that um, the things that I want to do are within grasp. And so I've, I've got time and that's, time is so precious. You know, we think about um, making money and, you know, being successful and all of those things. But the, what we're really talking about is how we measure our time, right? Ooh, that sun is really coming in now. Let me just dial this back so you guys can see me a little bit better. Oh, thanks, Loretta. Yes, I put it up for my inspiration, my uh, Afronaut space, and then I'm working on stuff. Some of you might have seen my self-portrait. <laughs> does, it, does it look like me? <laughs> so I did that uh, last night, just a quick sketch. <laughs> and then I'm excited about this because at first I didn't like um but now I feel like she's coming into her own um this is one of my you know as a collage artist how do I put these pieces together and so I'm working on a piece that will bring her coming out of the earth oh, there goes my moon reaching for the moon and so I'm kind of like just piecing it together right now. I'm working on the back layout and all of that. And so I'm kind of excited because at first, when I drew her, I was a little like, oh, it's not right. And I, I, I don't feel really comfortable about detail and face yet. But then I, I put in some detail uh, in, in her face. And I, I now I really like it as she's reaching out. I feel like it's more representative of me reaching for the moon. <laughs> so, uh, so my art, I got to get back to doing some art. So yesterday, last night, I sketched out a couple of things and that felt so good to be able to do that. And, and then I also got to read, you know, we're talking about reading and I get these magazines because you know, when you have points you can't use. We, I, we had some Delta points, um, me and my ex-husband. So I get my Bon Appetit, Bon Appetit. And there was this article in here that really resonated and it's called Why I, Cook, Why I Keep Cooking. So I know this is flipped for you, but it's Why I Keep Cooking. And I gotta put on, I wanna read a passage to you this morning. I know this is different, but I just wanna talk to you about um, this really resonated with me with my meals from Mars and being a space chef and stuff like that, but also about being black and what that means in America. And so this is why I keep cooking as a black chef who has been navigating a white led restaurant industry for decades. I've encountered racism at nearly every turn, but I've never given up. So it starts with this, and she's just 10 years older than me. So she's 60. And her name is Deborah Von Trace. And so it says, I was in my early 20s the day I went shopping at a store in Independence, Missouri. It was a day like any other. I don't remember what store it was. What I do remember is being accused of stealing something. Within minutes, a policeman was approaching me. I told him I didn't do anything. He hit me over a head with a bully, billy club and knocked me unconscious. I remember coming to as he was dragging me across the ground and throwing me 
into the back of his police car. I remember the long drive to the station. I remember that when we got there, they, weren't, they went through my bag and saw right away that I hadn't stolen anything, that I was a college student, that I'd never been in trouble. Okay, they said, you can go. Hmm. Right? Okay, you can go. Thanks for the hit, the hit on the head. You can go. I remember um, being followed as a kid when I went through the store by the security uh, and making sure, you know, me and my friends weren't stealing anything. And, and so this really, when I read, when I heard those words, it really made me think back to my childhood and how when I would be walking, and it was me, I was the only black person, but me and my two friends, um, and sometimes being chased outside of the store and just thinking, <laughs> but you're a kid, so you're like, ah, you know, but the, the consequences of those moments um, and not realizing it as a kid, how dangerous that situation could be. Back then, I wasn't a chef yet. I didn't have any awards under my belt or recognition to my name. I didn't know what the decades ahead would look like, what I'd go through to get to where I am today. What I'd go through to get to where I am today. Oh, um, owner of an award-winning Atlanta soul food restaurant. Back then, I was young and I was black. That was it. I was young and I was black and I was shopping someplace somebody thought I shouldn't have been. Every black person has stories like this. We have some that are collectively the same and some that are, are our own as individuals, but something happened to all of us and that's why we speak out. And so this article, you know, that, that's the opening paragraph. Um, and again, it's, it's in the Bon Appetit. Um, this is, I collect them and then I read them later. And so I don't even know, but it's stories of transformation and perseverance is what this, uh, ep this monthly one is about. And then she goes on and talks about how all of the restaurants were, um, owned by, you know, it was all the white chefs that were famous and how she had to navigate her space and the, the words that people used and the assumptions that they had with her coming in as a black person. But then she talks about how, you know, she, her, her heart is in soul food and how soul food has been adopted and changed by other, you know, white chefs claiming it as their own and, and calling the food not soul food, but Southern food, um, you know, as a Southern style and, and, and making that, you know, something that was of black kind of um, historically black and black origin and making it acceptable in a white way um, by relabeling. And so very fascinating story because of my love for food. I don't think about, you know, I hadn't thought about this and all of the chefs that I like and follow and, and the things about them, they're great. They're really interesting people, but it's very, again, um, I've lived my entire life in, uh, it, to some extent in a white space of following white um, people as leaders in all of the things that I love even though there are black people out there doing this. And, and I, I, I kind of question um, now as I'm going through my, my renaissance of what I've missed out culturally as a result of this. And so she talks about resilience and responsibilities um, in the food industry. And the, these days I see resilience as a responsibility. The food industry has always needed more financing and mentorship for people of color. And now I can help with that. I'm no longer content just sneaking through the door. Sneaking through the door. That's what I feel like I've been doing my whole life in academia. Sneaking through the door. Um, I'm no longer content with just sneaking through the door. I'm going to put my foot in it and hold that door open for the young black chefs behind me. That's why our leaders, MLK Jr., John Lewis, laid their lives on the line to tell future generations, you don't have to stand for this. Now there's an army of young people out there. They are frustrated, but they are educated and strong and smart. 
They're leaving jobs where they're treated badly and starting their own thing. She, she talked about how she had to go out and start her own thing um, and the struggles with starting her own restaurants. And so restaurants and pop-ups and cooking shows on Instagram. And that's that whole thing of like, okay, um, I've always wanted my own show. You know, I'm not getting it, <laughs> but I can do it. I can do it here. I can talk to you. I can, I can create my space and share my voice. And I don't have to wait for somebody else to tell me that, okay, Cyan, um, we can accept you now. I can't tell you how many times uh, I've been... You, you all know that I do the science shows on the Discovery Channel and um, the Science Channel. But it's interesting when I've talked to producers and stuff about getting my own show. And, you know, I, I mean, being told, oh, you'll never be able to get your own show because you're a black female. Uh, and so I've had that people say that to me. But I'm like, you know what? I don't need you to have my own show because I can create my own show. I have my cup of tea right here with all of you cheers so going on she says um so pop-ups cooking shows on instagram oh, i love that cooking shows on instagram that's their pivot and it's not just because of covid 19 it's because opportunities have never been offered to them right there opportunities have never been offered to them so they're learning to exist outside of the traditional power structure. They're shaking up the institutions. They're protesting out in the streets. And so I, I, this really resonates with me and thinking about my future and taking my future and my destiny into my hands. I've always tried to play it safe and be within the margins and think about how I can assimilate. And it's not that I don't think, assimilation is important to be able to understand cultural norms and stuff that society but shaking up those norms also is important and how you do that by empowering your own voice so here in the restaurant world those changes are ne are reverberating white chefs have always set the rules but it's time to question them maybe the little white man from Kentucky on the side of that bucket isn't the authority on fried chicken. So when I read that, I was like, ooh, Kentucky fried chicken. <laughs> Not the authority on fried chicken. I remember my grandmother, well, my great grandmother. So my great grandmother lived until she was 106, I think, something like that. Uh, Big Ma, everybody called her Big Ma, even though she was a little woman. She was Big Ma, the Reverend Elizabeth Powell, Youngstown, Ohio. And every time we went to see Big Ma, Big Ma, even in her 90s, had that cast iron uh, frying pan. And she would be in her heels cooking up fried chicken for you whenever you came. And so I just remember how that that's my Kentucky Fried Chicken it was my grandmother, um, great grandmother frying up chicken in, in the, <laughs> do you have that story? Do you know what I mean? Like those, those memories of your family and the things that they would make. And so maybe that little white man from Kentucky on the side of that bucket, isn't the authority on fried chicken. Maybe that biscuit recipe didn't come from your grandmother, but an enslaved person somewhere down the line. Maybe French cuisine isn't the standard. Maybe we need to kick the damn door down and maybe on the other side, there are possibilities beyond what we've ever imagined. I love, 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 love this last line, right? Of where she says, maybe we need to kick the damn door down. Seriously, kick the damn door down. And maybe on the other side, there are possibilities beyond what we've ever imagined. Oh, so that was a delight to read in my Bon Appetit last night um, and really getting me thinking about food and the culture of food because I, you know, you all know that I talk about that when I do my meals for Mars and thinking about 
what cultures will we bring to space? And we will bring them to some extent through the food we choose and the people we choose. The people we choose to send up and the food that goes with them is a big part of the culture that will develop in space. And so just a couple of things here. Yes, fried yucca and also <laughs> in heels. Was that you, Loretta? Was that your grandmother or your mom? That's awesome. As a, um, a white woman immigrant from European accent, I totally share your experience in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is why I'm building space economy, new economy place for all. Oh, thank you. I, I love that. I appreciate that. But that's the, the thing about being able to share our culture through food. And it, like I was saying in this talk that I just gave recently, that was one of the things that I was talking about is what cultural norms will we take to space, to the moon, to the Mars, um, and, and why? And it goes again with thinking about who has access to space, who's making those decisions, and how do we kick the door down so that if we're gonna have space for everyone, then we need to think about access for everyone. Your grandma, oh, I love that. Ugh. Oh, all my, it's funny to be 50 um, and have both my parents gone, my grandparents, my great grandparents, all of that legacy. Uh, but I, sh I carry that legacy, I feel like, here into the future. Um, thinking about my Afrofuturism, thinking about how to express how I'm feeling through art, through words, learning to be a wordsmith. English was my worst subject in college <laughs> my whole life <laughs> and so i look at an article like this and how i those words resonated with me and i think oh i could never write something so well but i'm telling myself i'm changing that narrative and saying with practice i will one day write something that is this well written i will write words that will resonate with people um and so that's one of the reasons why i'm taking my poetry class in the spring so that when I send out my art to people uh, on the back of the postcard, I can write words that really impact people here in the heart where they feel like, wow, I can't believe, you know, they, 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 they just love it. And it makes them think about some of these things in a way that just they hadn't thought of before. And that article really did that for me because it really take off my glasses. I keep seeing this reflection. Um, it really just made me think about food and my love of food and the history of the food and the food that my, my grandmother, great grandmother cooked, Big Ma, my Nana, like Loretta's Nana, um, my Nana cooked, but also my mom. I got a lot of my love of food from my mom. And so the things that we, she taught me to make like egg rolls and uh, grits and breakfast and <laughs> pork chops, fried pork chops, just all kinds of stuff. So that is um, my chat with you today about kicking down the door. It's not enough to just crack it open and slide your way through. Um, it's about kicking down the damn door and letting the herd come in, <laughs> the floodgates open and opening up that access to space. So my thoughts to you is how are you kicking down the door? Um, Loretta, I know you kicked the door wide open <laughs> and brought me in. And so I love that. Uh, I love um, Lady uh, Rocket Space, what you were saying about also giving access. Mike, who I think Mike jumped on, I was kind of going on there. And so Mike, if you're there, um, that I know you're all about opening up that door and providing access. And so thinking about ways in which in our lives, we help the people around us to be better. We reach out and we lift each other up. Um, we don't compete. We 
complete. <laughs> I love that. I can't remember who said that, but competing versus com completion and um, helping everybody come together, uh, complimenting like a good stew. <sighs> it's taking me a while to get there. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but with good friends like Mike and Loretta and uh, Space Racer and all of those that have helped me, and especially I feel like this past year in COVID, I have grown so much. And that's why I feel I feel this sense of renewal, this sense of of a phoenix, like I said, rising. I'm playing with that because I think I got to draw something there. I've got to figure out how to express that um, in my Afrofuturism kind of way of this rebirth of feeling like there are things that can be doing. Oh, Mac, you too. Um, that's a marathon reference. Oh, yay. That's cool. I didn't know that. Uh, it's great to see my friends here on here and, and listening to me and just uh, enjoying a cup of tea this morning because I'm just happy. And I think that that's showing through that I'm finally in a space where I wake up and I, I feel I feel good. And I love my hair. That's another topic that we will have to talk about maybe tomorrow. You know, <laughs> getting into black hair and um, going from uh, needing to have that long, beautiful, straight white hair to going to natural and short and curly. And for the first time, waking up and looking and seeing myself in the mirror and loving what I see when I see my hair. So... Okay, I've got to get going. I hope you all have a wonderful Monday and start of the week and helping, thinking about how you are helping others and reaching them and empowering them and using your voice to help make a difference. So thanks. And remember, if there's any comments that you really want me to know, um, they don't get saved in the chat here. You have to go back to the original video and you have to leave a comment. Um, but if there, you have any tips or thoughts about how ways you can express your voice or even some, you know, some of the things that you've done that have made a difference in kicking down the door and empowering others, you know, leave those tips and tricks and those thoughts in the comment once this video gets posted because then it gets archived and others who come along can enjoy that. All right, bye everybody.